Hey, do y'all remember being in a church where you had responsive readings? Hey, we're going to do it today. We haven't done that in a long time. And the Lord wanted me to, to like, let's break open some Messiah scriptures, some scriptures about Messiah. And he said, no better way to do that than to read them out loud. So Rachel's got us covered here. This is, if you need to know, number 494 in the church service hymns published in 1948 by Road Heaver Company. It's the brown hymnal at my house that is so well worn that the back is, the spine is falling out of the book. But it still has, love lifted me, love. It's still got all the goodies in there, all right? So, uh, Rachel's going to put it up here. Kevin's had on, um, he, he is, he's actually made it reader friendly for us. I've got the smaller version down here so that I'm not turning around. But my, you'll be reading the yellow words. If there's your challenge, if you, if you will accept it, you good? <clears throat> All right. You know, I want you to do whatever is comfortable for you. But if you, I love standing when we read the word. That's just me. I, I, it feels like an honor thing that I'm honoring the word. But if you need to sit, stay seated because there's also a seating part about reading the word. But if you can stand and I'll start. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse and a branch shall grow out of his roots. And the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of And shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes. Neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness shall he judge the poor. And reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins. And faithfulness the girdle of his reins. And the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid. And the calf and the young lion and the fat man together, and the little child shall lead them. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious, and he shall set up an ensign for the nation. And it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains. And many people shall go and say, Come ye, let's go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among the nations, and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come ye. And let us walk in the light of the Lord. And the people said, Amen. Amen. That's from Isaiah 11, 1 through 10, and Isaiah 2, 2 through 5. Lord, if there's power in, in saying and reading the, the word out loud and saying what God says, then have mercy when we say it together. Imagine what just got released in this room. 
At the beginning of Advent this year, I was reading from several of the Old Testament prophecies concerning the coming birth of the Messiah. Many of those are quoted again in Matthew and in Luke. But the readings I was following, instead of having me go read those Old Testament prophecies in the New Testament, sent me back every day just one or two verses in the Old Testament directly to those prophecies, those original prophecies and those prophets themselves. And the prophecies kept saying something like this, the king is coming. The king is coming. Hey, hey, did you know the king is coming? And it's almost like um, what I imagine pioneer people did when they built stack cakes, you know. There was a wedding or something going on special, and you wanted to celebrate that wedding. Everybody just brought a layer of a cake, and you assembled the cake when you got to the wedding. And so for 4,000 years, the prophets were bringing layer after layer after layer until God said, it's time. And sent his angels to sing the birth announcement of his son. Passages like Micah 5, 2. How about that? Oof. As for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, but not too little to be among the leaders of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord. And his people will live in safety because at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. And this one will be our peace. And when the songwriters read it, they wrote, Oh, little town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light. Matthew and Micah are only separated by a few pages in your Bible. But in building his case that Jesus is the Messiah prophesied by the Micah, 700 years earlier. Matthew went all the way back through time to grab Micah's word and say, he's here. He's here. Look to Bethlehem, Micah had said. But Joseph and Mary were from Nazareth, branch town, also important prophetically as even the Messiah himself would be called branch man by several prophets. The prophetic is a mystery, I'm telling you, until it's not. The birth in Bethlehem had been prophetically determined, but inconvenient circumstances brought it into reality, as I've heard someone say. I wonder if Mary and Joseph knew the strategy that Paul reminded Timothy that he would need to use in order to go through spiritual warfare. I wonder if they knew they could use prophetic words concerning the Messiah to make it all the way to Bethlehem 40 weeks pregnant. That's 90 miles, people. Riding a donkey. I once went into labor at six months by taking a long car ride. The bumps, the jiggles, the rhythmic movement put my body into labor. On no planet would I have ever wanted to put myself in a situation to have to tell Danny Robertson to pull over on I-40 and deliver our son or daughter. And neither would Danny have wanted me to put him in that position. 
You know that song, Mary, did you know? I think we need to add a verse, and it says, Mary, did you know that you'd barely make it to Bethlehem before you had that baby? Like, did she know she would make it? Night after night, they had to camp. Did she war with Micah 5 too? Oh, little town of Bethlehem. Hmm. Here's a little side note. Every time we get a prophetic word to hold on to, somehow in my brain, I also start thinking, Hallelujah, it will be easy now. <laughs> right? But scripturally speaking, I should think, Game on. The prophetic serves us by building us up, cheering us up, and drawing us near to God. The A, B, C, Ds of the prophetic as outlined by Paul in 1 Corinthians 14 when he says, pursue love, yes, but eagerly desire the prophetic. It's very important. But if it's anything, the prophetic is rarely convenient. Right? So, as you war with any spiritual, um, in any spiritual battle this season with a prophetic word, Know that the Lord will always build you up, cheer you up, and draw you near to him with a prophet, with his voice, with his prophetic word. But he, it will rarely be a convenient opportunity. As I read the Advent calendar, some messianic prophecies that I had not even considered became real to me. I knew the prophetic words, the messianic prophecies, um, like, um, you know, um, Psalm 22, the one that starts off, my God, my God, why hast, hast thou forsaken me? I knew about the math, uh, Micah 5, the Bethlehem, but I, I really hadn't considered some of the things I read during this Advent time on the calendar as prophetic, messianic mile markers, I guess I should say. Like Psalm 72. It was a psalm, uh, a song written for the king. Possibly written by Solomon. More likely written by his daddy for Solomon. But the real beauty is when you read it, with prophetic messianic glasses on and know it's about Jesus. When Jesus is unveiled in this song, it tells about the kings who will come and worship him with gifts. You know, we sing, We three kings of Orient are. They were not ordinary kings. They were Magi, they were wise men. They were the intelligentsia of their day. They likely had traveled nearly two years searching for the Messiah, using only a star and some prophecy to guide them. Like many more than just the three that we see in every nativity, there were probably hundreds of them. At least caravans of them. Bill Johnson said something that struck me about this um, scene here with the wise men. He said, The queen of Sheba came to Solomon that he might explain mysteries. But these wise men searched for a baby king just to worship him. 
not to get anything from him, just to worship. In other words, they found, they searched for such a long time and brought so much of their own wealth to give, not for who he was, uh, I mean, not for, not for what he could do, but for who he was. Isn't that beautiful? And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly, the word says, with great joy. It's a crazy little t- phrase there. Exceedingly, rejoicing exceedingly with great joy means that they rejoiced excessively. Excuse me. That, maybe that was to wake somebody up. And violently. They worshiped violently. They had joy. I don't know if that's like, you know, cute aggression when you see a baby and you just want to squeeze them. (laughs) Worshiped with joy over the top and and bordering on violence. Johnson said that to see royalty in that kind of state would be an unusual sight. And the experience would not be entered into through logic and reasoning alone. So here you see some of the intelligentsia worshiping in a way that would be overwhelming. I mean, I had to like stop this morning and picture them sliding off their camels and jumping up and down for joy, being loud and boisterous. They didn't come in the quiet. They were loud. And, uh, you know, you can see this in Psalm 2 prophetically. It, uh, in Psalm 2, it says that, um, come and worship the Lord with fear, with reverence, and rejoice with trembling. And that word in Hebrew, rejoice, means to spin around to twirl around with excited emotions. And the passage in Psalm 2 goes on and says, you need to kiss the sun. Can you see these dignified kings sliding down off their camels outside Mary and Joseph's door? And they're already raising the roof. Can you imagine Joseph and Mary And Jesus, now likely a toddler probably, as this caravan of kings pulls treasures out to lay at this child's feet. I could see their faces this morning as I thought about it. Who would expect God to throw that kind of baby shower for his son when he was the one that chose a stable full of animal poop as the baby's first nursery. But God is full of surprises. And yet he told us what was going to happen. He said this was how it was going to be. Psalm 72, that one I was just talking about, this is the way the Passion reads. Different kings will surrender and come with their gifts from every continent and coastland. They will offer gifts of tribute to you, O king of kings. They will all bow before you, O king of kings. Every nation will one day serve you. Also hit this beautiful scripture, which is where this passage comes from today and um, this nice gift. It's um, Numbers twenty four seventeen. This is an unlikely candidate as a prophetic voice declaring that the Messiah was coming. Balaam, the mixed bag. Balaam actually gets quite a bit of airtime as a prophet, both in the Old Testament. And he's mentioned on the reg in the New Testament. Really, he's worth a look. Especially since Jesus himself brings up the topic of Balaam to one of the churches in Revelation 2. Now, Balaam was hired 
by the king of Moab to come and curse Israel as they were coming into the land of promise. But as he stood in a high... Y'all, and y'all know the story how his own donkey was talking to him. Y'all know the story, right? It's the place, you know, Christians like to say, well, his mm-mm was talking to him. I know y'all were all thinking it. I might as well go ahead and say it. <laughs> now, Balaam was hired to curse Israel as they came into the land of promise. But as he stood at the high place and looked down at the nation camping tribe by tribe, you know, God had them laid out in a specific order. And when you, if you could take a bird's eye view of the way he had them camping, you would see the cross, the way the, the tribes lined out as in their camps. And as Balaam saw that, it says he looked down at the nation camping tribe by tribe. And the word says that the Spirit of God came on Balaam. And he said this, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not close at hand. A star will march forth out of Jacob, and a scepter will rise out of Israel. A star, a rolling, blazing, sparkling, flashing prince will tread, will march out of Jacob will take his bow and bend it and string it and put it on his back ready to use. This is a war term. A star not going to just come forth, but is going to come out like a warring army. A star will march forth out of Jacob. A scepter a rod, a staff, an offshoot, a branch, a shepherd's rod, a king's scepter. You know, there's no way Balaam could have known the words that Daddy Jacob spoke over Judah before he passed. What is that? 400 years before. But this is what Jacob spoke over Judah in Genesis 49. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. Until he comes to whom it belongs. So Balaam, hired to curse this people, stood up there and blessed them and gave a slice of cake, brought a whole layer and said, I see him, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not close at hand. But he's coming. So I want to look at that word star and that word scepter because I think that they're rich with the prophetic meaning not just for 2,000 years ago but for right now. A star will march out. A star will tread out enemies. A star will bend a bow and string it. This is a prince. And with the star marching out, We're all the way back to Matthew 2 again. I remember a sermon I heard once, and the preacher said, the first question in the Old Testament is God asking, where are you? Now, God knew where Adam and Eve were, but he wanted them to know where they were. And... I'll give you counseling, uh, a counseling 101 class in three questions. 
This is, this is it. You ready? You too can be a counselor. First question, where are you now? Second question, where do you want to be? Third question, how can we get you there? That's counseling 101. So God asked in Genesis the very first question, where are you now? But as the New Testament begins with a question, it says, where is he? Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. I'd say that when that question was asked, where is he who is born king? Is answering both the second counseling question and the third. It's, ask, it's saying, where do you need to be? Wherever he is. How can we get you to him? However he takes me there. Have we, um, uh, this has been the question I think that has been on my mind going through this Christmas season. Have I, like those wise men, even like Balaam, have I seen his star in this season? Am I on my way to worship him? Am I kissing the sun? It may seem trite, but you know that saying, wise men still seek him? It is absolutely true, isn't it? Like that's the wisest thing we could do. And to come in joy. <laughs> in joy. Excessive and violent joy. That word scepter is used over and over and over in Scripture. It means exactly what you think it means. It's a rod. It's a, a branch, a shoot. It, it's, um, it can be a shepherd's rod. It can be a king's scepter. It, it's also the word that they use to translate whenever they're saying the word tribe or clan. This is, this is the word that's frequently used. Because it's about, usually, if you think of a king's scepter, it's about law. But then there's another kind of scepter that, we, that um, when David penned the 23rd Psalm, and he said, Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me, right? And so the picture, the whole picture of Messiah has to include not only a rod of iron to rule the nations, but a shepherd's staff to comfort and to lead, right? That's the beauty of our king. And so uh, even Genesis 49, then I told you that uh, was Jacob's words over the tribe of Judah, this is a part of the, the scepters even mentioned in that, in that passage of Scripture from Genesis 49. He said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh comes. And then Psalm 2, which I've also mentioned, Yahweh said to my Lord the Messiah, Sit with me as enthroned ruler. Excuse me, that's not Psalm 2, that's Psalm 110. Sit with me as enthroned ruler at my right hand while I, while I subdue your every enemy and they will bow before you as I make them a footstool for your feet. Messiah, I know God himself will establish your kingdom and stretch forth your strong scepter as you reign in Zion glory. For he says to you, Rule in the midst of your enemies. A star and a scepter. I listened to an apologist a couple of days ago. Um, it was one of those um, 
Sometimes I'm never sure if Google's listening to me or if it's the Holy Spirit. You know, one of those situations. So it was just a rando thing, but I was like, I don't know. This is really weird because this is exactly what the sermon was going to be about. I had this unction that um, the Lord wanted me to go back and uh, because I was being so encouraged by these messianic prophecies from the Old Testament that kept saying, He's coming. He's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And the surety of those prophetic words and then seeing him show up. And then Peter saying in 1 Peter, he said, listen, some of us went up on the mountain with him and we saw the glory. And you know, Jesus was transfigured in front of them. And Peter said, We were eyewitnesses. We saw what happened when the glory came on him. We heard the voice, the the voice of God say, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And he said, So you have the prophetic word made more sure, as if you needed. It to be made more sure. This apologist said, he used a book by two authors named Stoner and Newman to figure the statistical probability of one man who was able, if one man could fulfill all Old Testament messianic prophecies. Could you get that many check marks in just one person? What are the chances that any one man could fit all those prophetic words spoken over 4,000 years to different people and yet they all find fulfillment in only one man? And of the hundreds of messianic prophecies, these two authors only used eight of the most recognizable passages like Micah 5.2, that he had to be born in Bethlehem. Other seven passages were ones that prophesied the Messiah would have a forerunner, just like the gospel writers made a big deal. Jesus even said, oh yeah, I've got a forerunner. His name is John. Yeah, he came, he came in the spirit of Elijah. Um, it, it, the, the ones that described that his wounds would be in his hands and his feet from Zechariah and Psalms, that he would be sold for 30 pieces of silver, which was prophesied by Zechariah and um, in the Psalms, that he would choose not to defend himself from accusation as prophesied by Isaiah. Now, just eight of the many more that are available, the probability that any one of these prophecies could accurately point to Jesus thousands of years after they were spoken, hundreds and even thousands, is astounding. But the probability when you link them together and you say, this man had to be born in Bethlehem But he also had to die in Jerusalem by a method by which he had his hands and his feet pierced and that he was rejected and turned traitored by a friend. And he had a forerunner. You see what I'm saying? That one alone would be crazy. But all eight of the prophecies that they chose, that all eight would find Fulfillment in one man looks something like this. One man in 100 million billion. Or graphically, they said, you'd have to level the state of Texas out so it was completely flat. And then cover the entire state with silver dollars, two feet deep. And I went and got the, actually went and got the measuring tape. 
that hits me about right here. If you can imagine wading the entire state of Texas, which is knee deep in silver dollars. And somebody goes into outer space and takes one of those silver dollars and makes a tiny little mark on it and drops it down into the at random state of Texas. And then somebody else is able to mix them all together. And you have to pull out that one marked silver dollar on your first try. That's how hard it would be to find one man who could fulfill just eight of those Old Testament prophecies. Now, suppose you decided to choose something more like 48 of them. Make the range broader. The chances that one man could fulfill all 48 of those Old Testament prophecies moves to 1 in 13 trillion. Change those silver dollars to the size of electrons. Change Texas to the entire universe. Mark one electron and randomly place it somewhere in the entire universe and find it the first place you look. That's if one man could fulfill 48 Old Testament prophecies saying he was the Messiah. By some counts, there are over 350 Old Testament prophecies concerning Messiah. So not even 48. And all of them check, 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 check. Until we hit the ones, some of which we read at the beginning of this service. Right? The ones that say what will happen. You know, you got the 4,000 years of he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. He's here. What have we been hearing for 2,000 years? He's coming back. He's coming back. He's coming back. <laughs> If there's so much surety that he's the man that came, then what are we to believe? There's a couple of passages that mention a star, a particular star in Revelation. In Revelation 2, and Revelation 22. In chapter 2, it's a, if you got your Bibles and you're circling, this is where I'd circle, right here. I'd make a lot of notes right here. Jesus actually tells the church, if you will hold fast until I come, and you will walk in being an overcomer, you know, stand with me while I string my bow. If you'll do that, I will give you a scepter of iron and the authority to rule over nations. And just throw it in as a bonus, I'm going to give you the morning star. And then, almost like a bookend, this is like, he's like, John, you got enough room on the scroll to write this last thing? I got one more thing to say to the churches. Behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things for the churches. 
I am the root and the offspring of David. I'm the root and the shoot, as Danny said. I am the bright morning star. So for 4,000 years or so, Messianic prophecies have said, He's coming, He's coming, He's coming. Until those who look for Him said, He's here. And He came as the Lamb of God. But I'm telling y'all, He's returning as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And I just felt the Spirit of the Lord wanting to nudge us to remember the sure word of prophecy that brought him the first time will most assuredly bring him again. Psalm 110 is one of those passages that I read. It's the one, you know, it's about the return of the king. It's the one that begins, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. And the Lord will stretch forth his strong scepter from Zion. And it's actually quoted more often in the New Testament, I believe, than any other Old Testament prophecy. Something like eight times David's psalm is quoted in the New Testament. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorites. He's written a book uh, called Reflections on the Psalms. I'm going to end here. This is what he says. He says, we find in our prayer book, as he's talking about, I guess, at his church, his responsive reading. He said, we find in our prayer book that Psalm 110 is one of those appointed to read on Christmas Day. We may at first be surprised by this. There's nothing in it about peace or goodwill toward men. Nothing remotely suggestive of the stable at Bethlehem. So the note on this psalm should say, not peace and goodwill, but beware, he's coming, he's coming, oh, he's coming, amen, so I'm going to call the praise team up, you know, the word says that Every time we take this meal, we're preaching without saying a word. And Jesus said at some point to the people, he said, you know, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood will have life everlasting. And that word eat there is an unusual word. It means to gnaw like you would a bone. I love it when the bread is particularly crunchy. I just imagine myself around the table of the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's the sound. That's the sound that every demon hears. As I crunch that bread. And swill that juice. I want him to hear me smack my lips. You know. um, There's power. In knowing. That God has a plan, isn't it? There's just such power in it. And he will not be, he will not be thwarted. And the enemy will not make him do anything in haste. 
and it will not slow him down. And I just think there's power in us recognizing the incredible mind of God today. And that he loves us so much, he'd be willing to say, he's coming. Right? And so, Lord, we just thank you for this meal. And, Father, if there's anyone here um, that needs to make a public profession of faith, then, Lord, we come into agreement. And we'll just say it out loud, too, but don't, don't leave um, either the space that you're on online or even physically in here today without saying that I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the, my Savior, my Lord, and my King. Amen. Oh, there's power in that. There's power in that profession. And so like Peter, I just thank you for your people, Lord. And I, I thank you that day star is rising in our hearts. That we have a prophetic word made more sure. That even as darkness is around, we know that the light has come and is growing ever brighter. And we'll agree like at the end of Revelation, John said, agree like this, come Lord Jesus, right? Come Lord Jesus. And thank you for this meal, Lord. It's a meal that heals and brings us back to a place of dependency at your table. It's very important. We thank you for every bite and every sip. And um, may our bodies preach the power of Jesus' resurrection. In Jesus' name.